Hello, my name is Darvo Jul Magnussen and I'm the principal trombone of the RSNO. And with me, I have Jay Kapperold. Jay, you have written us and Catherine a flute concerto. It's called Our Gilded Veins. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Our Gilded Veins is inspired by the ancient Japanese art of Kintsugi pottery. Um, and so essentially in that tradition, you mend broken objects together using gilded lacquer in order to highlight the, the breakage of, of that object. So instead of throwing it out, you put it back together again, but you make sure that everyone knows that that object has been broken. Um, and for me, that that's sort of too delicious a metaphor for the, the human concept, essentially. You know, everyone goes through life, life happens to us. Um, and it's, it's not about discarding those breakages or traumas in any way, but trying to sort of integrate them within ourselves um, and, and celebrate that breakage so that it makes us more whole as a human being as, as we go forward. Yeah. I'm afraid it was a leading question because I knew that this concerto was coming. It's actually been on the way for quite a few years, mm -hmm. right? And uh, quite recently, I broke my uh, favorite coffee cup <laughs> and uh, I uh, glued it together, but uh, my partner, Emily, decided to gild the veins. It's sort of funny, I mean, Kintsugi, obviously it's been around for, for centuries as, as a practice, but it's only now that people are starting to find their way to it as a, as a practice, you know, whether it's you know through their, their own objects, it's kind of become something that's a bit vogue. You often see it in sort of adverts now, but when Catherine and I were talking about it, we've been having this conversation about the concerto since maybe 2016, I think. Um, and now we've just started bizarrely seeing it kind of crop up. So it's all been kind of, what's the word, ceremony? Um, I'm so happy to see uh, yet another piece by you being played by us. I like it so much because it's positive. It's very complicated, but at the same time, there's always a sort of a, there's a brightness um, and yeah, just posi positivity in your music. I think it's, it's very, very kind of you to say so. <laughs> it really is. Um, and I mean, in terms of the, the sort of positive aspect, certainly the concerto, Our Gilded Veins, is intentionally more positive than some of my um, previous compositions. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, when, you, when we think about Kintsugi, it's the idea of integrating that brokenness in order to forge a positive existential outcome, if you like. Um, and so, the sort of narrative of, of the concerto starts off in a place of darkness, but then finds its way to a place of, of lightness. So it really is a kind of, um, you know, for, for want of a better sort of phrase, it's my kind of ode to joy in some sort of sense, really, um, because it's about using those sort of breakages and forging something that's then more positive as you sort of move forward. It's, it's not something that I, I've, I've ever really thought about intentionally with regards to my other compositions, but just as the way that I sort of you look at life from my own kind of perspective and kind of philosophy on life, I'm actually a bit more of a kind of natural pessimist, funnily enough, um, but I'm always conscious to try to be a bit more optimistic. Um, and I think in some sort of way, if you look at them as two sides um, of, of the opposite um, sort of balancing act, if you like, if there's too much of one on either side, it becomes fantasy, really. And what I'm interested in is trying to find that middle point where reality exists. Um, and especially when you think about um, you know, mental health or accepting traumas that we've all been through. It's about trying to view those traumas realistically and not in terms of the fantasy of it. So the Kanshugi, which is behind the concerto, is actually really just like a beginning metaphor for something that's much deeper that, yeah. that lies in your Yeah, piece. absolutely. It's really yeah. what, we, what we were wanting to talk about was, was mental health. Um, and f for me, uh, you know, as a composer, um, but also maybe not as a composer, if I wasn't going to go down a musical route or if music fails in some sort of way, I would love to have studied psychology oh. um, in, in some form. I, I'm not really sure what, what that would look like. Um, but I've always been interested in psychological elements and that always plays into my music. Music, funnily enough. I really love minimalist music and mm. when I listen to your music I, I, I hear that but I hear actually not that much of it when I then get into the piece. Mm -hmm. There's always, there's, your, your, piece, your pieces kind of develop and move quite a lot faster than what I'm used to in, in the minimal, minimalism and I, you, you use to me, you, you use themes mm -hmm. a lot more. You're, you're very strong thematically or it's just a Fancy way of saying, I like your tunes. <laughs> you. <laughs> you use melodies a lot and that, that mm -hmm. is, I, yeah, you never shy away from that. And I think that's very good. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a fair observation. I think there is a directness to, to my music um, and, a, and a simplicity, but 
then there are other things that are going on under the surface that make it a bit more uh, complex. Um, and, and as you say, there are themes, and I think that comes from my love of you know film music growing up as a youngster um, and just loving something to hang on to in, in that way. Um, but then finding other kind of textural elements or something that kind of bubbles away underneath the surface that makes it a bit more um, contemporary or modern in that sort of way. And um, that certainly happens in the, the flute concerto. In the beginning, we, we, we start off in a place of, of um, trauma, if you like. So no two lines stick together. They're all very disparate and it's quite a complex sort of texture. Um, and it all sort of fades away at, at, um, at, at one point and then sort of gradually builds itself back up, back up but it's more fragmented. Um, so we've got all these individual lines that everyone's playing in a kind of improvisatory way. And Catherine is sort of floating above um, all of that and kind of observing the shards as they all sort of interact. And it gradually pieces itself together so that it becomes a whole unit um, and then the kind of um, motorized sort of rhythm comes in and the whole piece becomes a kind of solid form as all the pieces are glued back together and eventually that kind of works itself to a point where again it just completely breaks apart and it kind of has to in some sort of way because the, the philosophy is, is that we're celebrating the brokenness so we've come together as a, as, as a kind of unit if you like but it has to absolutely shatter again but the, the shattering point is then viewed in a completely different context, a different harmonic context, but a different emotional context as well. So that it's saying that it's okay for that breakage to have happened. But there are certainly themes throughout all of uh, that, that musical material um, that hopefully hold it all together and make it, I suppose, um, followable as a kind of structure. Because mm -hmm. it is one 20 minute piece that just kind of tran uh, transitions into each other, essentially, in terms of the movements anyway. So there's no clear sort of fast movement, slow movement, fast movement, etc. But there is a kind of overarching structure that kind of keeps a kind of shape to it a wee bit. But there are certain themes that suggest uh, where that character is in its journey. If, if you think of the flute as the character that's going through a trauma and trying to piece their life back together again, but then celebrate that trauma at the end. Jay, we, I've met you before, of course. You were one of the first uh, composers on Compo Composers Hub, but we studied together as well. Sure. And um, uh, you, you said you wanted to study uh, psychology, uh, but when I met you, you weren't studying psychology or composing. You were studying saxophone. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I sort of made that transition into the even darker world of composition from <laughs> <the> even darker. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, though, I'm, I, I, these days I probably have to dust the saxophone case off a bit. Okay. <laughs> but um, you, because but you still have them. I still have them. I you do still have them. Them. I don't yeah. think I would be able to let them go, right. you know, because they're so precious to me, really. Yeah. And, and I've got so so many fond memories of my yeah. time as a saxophone player and studying at uh, the Royal Conservatoire. But these days, my focus mainly is, is in composition. So I tend to be sort of chained yeah. to my computer yeah. um, writing music, which I feel so, so lucky that I'm able to do. Yeah. And, and to, to say that you've got a career as a composer, you know, I really am just kind of going around just constantly pinching myself, to be <laughs> honest. It's a bit of a dream come true, really. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I suppose I, I made that that change from a saxophonist to a composer uh, because I felt I wasn't really capable enough as a musician, to be quite honest. Um, and there were things that I wanted to be able to express that I thought I would be able to express them better through you know, phenomenal musicians <laughs> such as the RSNO and, and all the great musicians that are working in Scotland. Um, and so it's a way, in a way, it's, 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 um, it's kind of a, a a way for me to sort of fulfill my own personal journey as a musician in order to work with people like Catherine Bryan, who's such an incredible musician. I've got so much respect and, and admiration for, for her playing. Um, and she's just doing a phenomenal job on the concerto. We've had a few rehearsals along the way. And obviously we, we had long conversations um, throughout the writing process and I would send her fragments to get feedback from. Um, and that for me is all part of that process of, of fulfilling that kind of musical journey for yeah. me. I, I am sometimes jealous of composers because they get to play a hundred instruments at the same time rather than just the one. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I know, I know that's the thing and there are always things to learn. You yeah. know, every rehearsal throws up something entirely new, whether it's a string technique or, you know, breathing in, in, in the brass section or wind mm. section or other sort of sounds that you can get from the percussion section as well. There's so much that gets thrown up mm. so that it means that you're constantly learning and constantly developing as you go forward um, because composition is, is a lot, you're in it for the long game, essentially, mm. or in it for the long term. Could you say something about the root 
and how you become a composer. I found my way to composition just by listening to a lot of, of classical music when I was younger and, and just fell in love with composers and thought that that was maybe something that I wanted to do. But actually, I wasn't really aware that compose composers were still alive until I was really a sort of late teenager, <laughs> to be honest. Um, because you go, you go through sort of high school education and, you know, there are a lot of you sort of like you know older composers who um, are you know are hundreds of years old, and so you just assume that composers are all dead. Um, and so it wasn't until I was sort of maybe fourteen or fifteen uh, that I went along to a concert with the the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, who were playing some James Macmillan music. And he's a living composer, very much so, um, and also happens to be from my area of of Cumnock, funnily enough. And so to me that was like a double whammy. You know, not only are composers still alive, but there, there is one from my area. Um, so in terms of a, a sort of a, a journey into composition, that was how I kind of came across it. I don't know that there are um, fixed kind of blueprints as to how you become a composer or how you can go about it or how you might want to. And um, those uh, traditional sort of journeys that composers have taken in the past, certainly, maybe it's, it's, it's worth kind of discouraging that. I don't know. Certainly in, in a modern sense, um, it's a very personal journey now. The, the concern that I've got certainly is that people can be priced out of, of those, um, certainly if you're, if you're from economic backgrounds um, um, that, that don't allow you access to, to those sorts of institutions, mm -hmm. which means then that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from a, a working class background myself and certainly looking at those sorts of, um, those sorts of journeys, you know, you do kind of worry about that and say, oh, this world is not for me potentially. Yeah. Um, so that hierarchy in composition um, maybe doesn't exist as it, as it did as a kind of traditional form because um, we're far more liberated these days to be able to sort of do what we like as composers. You can build your own online presence, you can find your own audiences certainly these days. Um, and so, you know, the world's your oyster, if, you know, and I think life is, is uh, there's always a phrase that kind of sticks with me in, in some sort of ways that um, life is, is, is what you make it, but it's what you put into it and what you then get from it. So the more you put into it, the more you get from it. Interesting to hear, because also from a musician's perspective, you, you see these hierarchies all around you. But if I look backwards in my career, and if I look at examples like yourself, those hierarchies get broken all the time. And it's definitely more about what you put into it. So thank you very much, Jay. And I look forward to hearing the concerto, and I look forward to hearing more pieces by yourself. Thank you.